a lot of people talk about conspiracies over a shadow government. I'm willing to testify before Congress that these black operations do exist. I nearly became part of it. But I saw the light, I think. <laughs> or was it? And I got out. And that's it. I have with me the uh, voice tapes of the uh, controllers that were involved, the FAA original tapes. See, after we handed this stuff off to the president's staff, the FAA didn't know what to do with it. We don't separate UFOs from real traffic, so it's not our problem. Okay? I have a copy of the original of the uh, video that we took, which is rather interesting. And once, once the thing was all over, the report started coming into my office, but because it wasn't an FAA air traffic problem, the FAA's report ended up on a table in my office and it stayed there until I retired when one of the staffers packed up all my gear and helped it move to my house. Also, in a box I found just a few days ago in my 1992 tax return, I have the target printouts from the uh, computer data which so if you wanted to or, or, or look at every target that was up there at the time, you can now reproduce this from this piece of paper here. And it's called the UFO Incident, uh, Japan 1648, I believe the number was, that happened on November the 18th, 1986. And uh, it is a truth. Now because of this, I've stayed interested in UFOs and I'm the Eastern Director of the Mutual UFO Network. And between the uh, National Reporting Center and Peter Davenport and the MUFON, we get 100 reports a week on average of people from all over the United States that see these things regularly. And if you start checking, they're out there and they're low and people are seeing them all the time. And these are highly qualified people, all of whom essentially give us the reports by email. I would like to relate about three different experiences, if you will, that relate to UFOs. As a young lieutenant over in Germany, Ramstein Air Base, Germany, back in the early 60s, I was in charge of the cryptographic center. I had a top secret crypto clearance at that time. And I can clearly recall seeing a message that went through my crypto center which said that a UFO, a UFO had crashed on the island of Spitsbergen, in Norway and the team of scientists were coming to investigate it. Going forward to the 1967 time frame, I was assigned to the 28th Air Division at Great Falls, Montana and I was the officer in charge of the communication center there. Also, I was a top secret control officer for the division I uh, had a crypto account, I was an account custodian, and I also passed out nuclear launch authenticators. During that time, I can recall seeing a message come through that communication center which said, basically what Bob was just got through talking about, is that a UFO was seen near the missile silos and the missiles were deactivated. Coincidentally, my first, the person that Boeing sent to investigate the particular missile conditions, if you will, what made them shut down, was my first manager at Boeing, Mr. Bob Kaminsky, who has since passed away. And I can recall him on different occasions. He lived close to me in Auburn, Washington. That's where I'm from. And he said, Arnie, he says, those missiles were perfectly clean. That was the result. So the one last incident concerned when I was in the as a commander of the unit in uh, Great Falls, or in the Caswell Air Force Station, Maine, I had contacts with the security police at Lauren Air Force Base, and they told about UFOs that were seen near the uh, nuclear weapon storage areas on Lauren Air Force Base. They were traveling so fast that you could almost see a pattern left by, if you are computer people, when you move a mouse real quick across the screen, you see a little bit of a tail. Well, that's exactly the way these six or seven craft worked. After five minutes of watching these things, they all seemed to group up to the west, northwest. Okay? They started to come in on a circle. But what I would like to point out is that where they were putting on their display in the north-northwest sky, 
Just directly east of that is what is known as Area 51. Area 51 is a AEC name, okay? Atomic Energy Commission. That was the old name for Atomic Energy Commission. We knew it as the Groom Lake Flight Test Facility in the Air Force. And it was where we tested our aircraft at the, after we got the prototype made from the Skunk Works. So here are these, let's get back to the circle in the sky. What they did was coalesce and, and started rotating in a circle and then they disappeared. Well, I thought, gee, this is something that we have to keep quiet. And that was verified by the chief of security. But we waited there and talked it over for a little bit. And it seemed like, I think it was an hour. Then came the radar people from the scopes, which were at 10,000 plus feet, came down for their dinner at two o'clock in the morning. And the first person off the bus was a good friend of mine, Anthony Kesar. He said, he was white as a sheet, and he says, did you see that? Yeah, we all said, yeah, yeah, it was a nice display, what a show. He says, we documented them on radar. And he says, we didn't give them clearance. We just, the standing order was let them fly through the radar beam. He says, we documented six to seven UFOs. I was contacted by Ms. Smith and asked in my capacity as general counsel to United States Jesuit Headquarters uh, National Social Ministry Office to see if we could obtain access to the Vatican Library to obtain the information that the Vatican had with regard to extraterrestrial intelligence and the phenomenon of UFOs. Uh, I pursued that with the permission of Father William J. Davis, the director of the national office, and we were refused access. Uh, as the United States Jesuit order to the information in the possession of the Vatican Library. When I reported this to Ms. Smith, uh, she then later subsequently asked me to uh, participate in a project which I can go into some detail during the question and answer period or later to individuals, uh, pursuant to which uh, I was uh, given access to, as a special consultant to the United States Library of Congress Congressional Research Service, to the classified portions of the Blue Book project of the Air Force. At that point, it was in 1977, approximately uh, May of 1977, I went to the Madison building of the United States Library of Congress. There was no one in the building at that time. It was brand new. I was directed to a basement uh, office uh, where there were two uh, guards uh, at the door and a third uh, sitting at the table who took my identification uh, verified that I've been designated as a special consultant to the Congressional Research Service of the United States Library of Congress and was admitted to the room. I thereupon found photographs, some dozen photographs, of what is unquestionably a, an unidentified flying object on the ground that had crashed and plowed a furrow in a field of snow and it was embedded in a bank, an embankment. Uh, there were United States Air Force personnel surrounding uh, this craft, taking photographs of the craft. And uh, one of the photographs, I could see that there were some symbols on the side of the craft. So I, I proceeded through the photographs and found a close-up photograph of these symbols. Uh, I'd been instructed that I was to take no notes uh, and had to leave my briefcase and all my identification outside of this room. But I had brought with me a yellow pad. And so what I did is I opened up the yellow pad and refocused the overhead camera onto the same size as the, the cardboard backing of the yellow pad. And I physically traced the copies of the symbols on the side of this craft, closed the, the yellow pad back, put the, the microfiche back into the canister, reclosed the box that I had, and I said, it is time for me to leave. And I took this and proceeded to leave the office, at which point the security guard stopped me and one of them said, what is that you have there, Mr. Sheehan? At which point I handed the yellow pad to him and he flipped through all the yellow pages and never found the, the copy that I had. And so I took that with me and brought it to the United States Jesuit headquarters, had a meeting with the staff with Father William J. Davis, reported this to them, was authorized at that time by the United States Jesuit headquarters to make a report to the National Council of Churches and to request that United, uh, the, uh, the entire 54 major religious denominations of our country undertake a major study 
of extraterrestrial intelligence, which they declined to do. On the early morning of uh, March 16th, 1967, I got a call from my security guard, primary security guard upstairs. Uh, we had about uh, six, as I recall, uh, white security uh, airmen upstairs. I was downstairs 60 feet underground in a capsule uh, monitoring and uh, controlling 10 uh, nuclear-tipped Minuteman missiles. Uh, I got a call that morning uh, that they were seeing strange lights flying in the sky. Uh, I, I disregarded that call. I uh, told them to uh, call me when something more significant happened. Uh, I got another call uh, subsequent to that call. And this time it was a more uh, intense tone, and the, and the guard's uh, voice was very clearly very frightened. Um, he said there was a, uh, a bright, glowing red object hovering outside the front gate. It was oval-shaped. Um, he had all the other guards out there with their weapons drawn. Right after that call, I woke up my commander who was on a rest period, uh, uh, Fred Mywald. A retired colonel now, uh, and uh, told him about the phone calls. As I was telling him about the phone calls, my weapons started going down, uh, one after the other. They went into a no-go condition, what we call no-go condition. They were unlaunchable. Um, <clears throat> we lost uh, somewhere between uh, six and eight weapons that morning. Uh, within minutes of having received that second phone call of a UFO hovering outside the front gate. When I found out what the normal, what you normally do when you see a UFO, I was told that you notify NORAD, you don't necessarily write anything down, you don't write anything down, and you keep it to yourself. It's a need to know basis only. And NORAD one night called me about later in the year to let me know as a heads up that there was a UFO coming up the California coastline. I asked them what I should do about this. They said, nothing, don't write it down, just, it's just a heads up. And then late 1972, while stationed at the 753rd Radar Squadron in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, I received a couple panicky calls from police officers who were chasing three UFOs from Mackinac Bridge up I-75. So I immediately checked the radar, confirmed that they were there, called NORAD, and they were concerned because they had two inbound B-52s doing the Kinslow Air Force Base. So they diverted them because they didn't want any proximity of the two. For the last 21 years, I have worked as a conceptual artist for a variety of defense contractors. Uh, I've been involved uh, in conceptual artwork of the production thereof for uh, Rockwell on the X-30 program and also on the, uh, the high-step program that's spelled H-Y-S-T-P, means hypersonic testbed program. Uh, during the course of my career, I've twice had a secret security clearance. In 1967, while my father was stationed at Westover Air Force Base, the uh, headquarters for 8th Air Force Strategic Air Command, I witnessed and watched through a telescope a UFO which hovered over a nuclear weapons storage facility for approximately 10 minutes and then departed uh, with an acceleration approaching a bullet leaving a rifle barrel. Uh, in, uh, in 1988, in November, uh, a college buddy of mine, an associate by the name of Brad Sorensen, uh, informed me that he had personally witnessed three flying saucers at a very large hangar at Norton Air Force Base during the course of an air show that was held on Saturday, November 12, 1988. Uh, I subsequently uh, called my congressman from that district. Um, I called his office. This was Congressman George E. Brown, Jr., who at the time was the chairman of the uh, Congressional Committee on Space Science and Advanced Technology. I naturally assumed that since this presentation that Brad talked about was for top military brass and certain congressional uh, individuals that uh, his office must have coordinated this uh, with the local Air Force Office of Public Affairs. Uh, a male staff member in Congressman Brown's office not only confirmed the exhibit 
but the fact that there were three discs at that exhibit. These discs were hovering off the floor without any visible means of support. They were referred to as alien reproduction vehicles, also nicknamed the flux liner because they used high voltage electricity. Uh, later on, I obtained uh, photographs that were uh, taken in 1967 by a military pilot, Harvey Williams, flying a C-47 for the Air Force at 12,000 feet, approximately 25 miles southwest of Provo, Utah. Uh, this particular vehicle matches the so-called ARV uh, in all proportions and respects in terms of the detail of the shape of the craft. And this was photographed, as I say, in Ju June or July of uh, um, June of 1967. I had the opportunity to do extra work during downtime, which was between missions, and I walked into a photo lab, which was the NASA lab, across the hallway. I had a secret clearance, which is not that high, but I was able to go into restricted areas, which this was. Uh, at the time, I was talking to one of the techs in there, and he drew my attention to a photograph, that, a NASA photograph. It had a dot on it, and I said, what is that? Well, he drew my attention to it, and, he, and I said, is that a, a dot on the emulsion? And he said, and he's smiling, and he has his hands crossed, and he said, uh, round dots on the emulsion don't leave round shadows on the ground. And this was an aerial photograph of the Earth, I'm assuming the earth because it had pine trees on it and the shadows of the craft or whatever it was were in the same angle as the trees and by its very nature UFO and I wanted to clarify that to a gentleman that was talking to me means unidentified so I did not know what this was but I realized at this point that it's very secret that the, it was kept secret because I asked him what are you going to do with this piece of information and he said, we always airbrush these out before we sell them to the public. So they're pes pesky little creatures uh, appearing on this uh, photograph they wanted to get rid of. Uh, after that, I decided I would ask questions to other people that work there. And I found that I had to ask them away from the site and not on site. A guard told me that he was asked to burn some photographs and not to look at them. And there was a guard, another guard guarding him, who was in green fatigues, watching him burn the photographs. And he said he was too tempted. He looked at one, and it was a picture of a UFO. And he was very descriptive. I can go into that later with anyone. Uh, he immediately was hit in the head, and he had a big gash in his forehead. He was knocked out. And he's terrified, so he would have to be protected. Uh, another incident, I knew someone in quarantine with the Apollo astronauts. He told me that the Apollo astronauts saw crap on the moon when we landed. And that is what he told me. And he also was afraid, he said, that the astronauts are told to keep this quiet. They're not allowed to talk about it. Got the patriotic bug, joined the United States Army, ended up flying bombers in Europe, and ended the war transport in the Pacific. Finished college in the summer, late summer of 49, recalled to active duty in the newly formed United States Air Force. I was assigned to an organization called Office of Special Investigations. The Air Force, as most of you know, was formed in 1947. OSI as a central investigative agency for the Air Force was formed, I think, in 1948. So everything was relatively new. Needless to say, starting in 47, UFOs were rather new. The Air Force Intelligence, or Air Technical Intelligence Center, was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and I had my office in a building adjacent to it. And our organization was the worldwide investigative agency for the Air Force for any unidentified flying objects. This lasted for about two years. The project name was known as Project Grudge, it was a predecessor to a project known as Blue Book, which Ed Rupelt headed. During my experience with it, I would collect the data from, I didn't collect it, it was sent into my office. I analyzed it. As a pilot investigator, I was able to offer some bits of advice to the air technical intelligence people. Now, you might visualize a massive office, but as I recall, we had a first lieutenant, uh, a secretary, and a technical sergeant. That was the essence of Project Blue Book when it started, or Project Grudge. Blue Book then expanded somewhat. 
During the review as an analyst of these various documentary reports, if you will, or documents, I became clearly convinced that there was substance to what was being reported in that we had ground visual, ground radar, airborne visual, and airborne radar confirmation of some of these sightings. The individuals who made the sightings were everything from airline pilots, military pilots, police officers, some of the people that your lives depend upon on a daily basis. These are very reputable and credible people. I hope that the testimony here from very credible people will convince you of that and will further Steve Greer's disclosure project in that pressure needs to be brought to bring this to the attention not only of the Americans but of people all over the planet. These vehicles have been seen and confirmed all over the planet. I was in the United States Navy. I held a top secret crypto level 14 extra sensitive material handling security clearance. I worked in the code room at the Naval Communications Station in San Francisco. In 1969, I received a priority message from a ship near Alaska that uh, was classified as secret. The ship reported uh, merging out of the ocean uh, near Port Bow, a brightly glowing uh, reddish-orange elliptical object, approximately 70 feet in diameter, merged out of the water, <laughs> shot into space, uh, traveling at about 7,000 miles per hour. This was uh, tracked on ship's radar and substantiated. Uh, years later, I worked at the um, Naval Electronic Engineering Center in San Diego for 13 years. The um, co-worker who I worked with worked at the NORAD facility. When he first started working at the facility, he noticed objects going on the screens to track everything out in space and in the air. Objects going off the scale, doing right angle turns. When he inquired, um, his older supervisor advised him that, uh, quote, it was just a visit from one of our little friends. This month, in 1960 or 1958, about 6 a.m., I heard a noise outside that sounded like a pulsating transformer. I sat up in my bunk. I looked out the window. I saw a craft heading for the ground and crashed. Pieces broke off of that craft. Immediately took off again. So <clears throat> there's a lot more to that story, but I've got to speed this up. Now, the next night, I was on radar duty. I get a call from the Gaithersburg missile base. He says, hey, I got 12 to 15 UFOs outside, 50 to 100 feet above me. So I asked him, I said, what does it sound like? He took his head mic off, held it out the van window, and said, here. And the sound, the same sound I heard the previous morning, except a lot more of them. So I, my radar was on standby, so I immediately turned it on and got the blip just outside of the ground clutter. I marked it on my radar screen. And then for a few minutes later, all of a sudden they took off. As they took off, the, the sweep came around, hit the blip. The second, and when it came around, it hit it again. That blip was two thirds away off my radar scope. In order to get that far, at a constant velocity was 17,000 miles an hour. That was my first incident. The craft was tracked by radar in excess of 1,800 miles an hour. It never did get to our altitude. We had 31 passengers, plus the psychiatrists and the crew members that all sighted this at, at different areas. When we landed at Argentia in Newfoundland, we were interrogated by the Air Force, an excellent interrogation, Captain Paulson. When we landed at the Naval Air Test Center here at Patuxent River, we were required by Navy intelligence to make out individual reports. Out of the National Archives, I have the 18-page official Navy and Air Force report. I've made up a, a report to straighten out all the truth. There's a stack of books out there that's how to have written all of this up. 
so the truth is here. I will testify under oath before Congress that everything that I have said is true. We have to disclose what we know, and I am willing to testify before Congress under oath or before any other organization that what I witnessed is true. Uh, I'm prepared to go to Congress, to swear before Congress that everything I've told you people and everything that is here is the truth. And I'll be glad to testify to Congress that this is absolutely the truth. I will say at this point, to keep it short, that I will testify under oath as to what I say is true, and I will do so before Congress. Thank you. I'm uh, more than happy to testify under oath to these details to the United States Congress and we'd be happy to meet with any members of the press at that time. You may recall I also served as chief counsel to the Karen Silkwood case in which we uh, obtained the rulings in the Karen Silkwood case. I also served as chief counsel in the Iran Contra case. It was the first one to testify before the United States Congress to the existence of the off-the-shelf enterprise of Richard C. Cord and Albert Hakim. I'll be more than happy to share the details of what I believe to be the relationship between this off-the-shelf enterprise and the secret government which is concealing this information from the American public. And I am happy and proud to serve as general counsel to the Disclosure Project. I'm willing to testify to the truth of all these matters that I've spoken about in front of Congress under oath. And that night I answered many calls from uh, the police department, sheriff's department stuff. My standard response was that there was nothing on radar. And I will testify to this under oath to a congressional hearing. Um, according to Brad Sorensen, this is the basis of the technology for these anti gravity propulsion systems. This particular document here describes six different meetings involving uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency and cooperative efforts with the, the Russian uh, scientific community in investigating this. Uh, what is called the fundamental enabling technology that was originally discovered apparently by Nikola Tesla in the early 1900s. Anyway, uh, I could provide you much more detail in, uh, at a later time, and I am prepared to uh, testify in detail concerning these events and their truthfulness before Congress. I'm willing to testify before Congress that what I'm saying is true. I am willing to sign a sworn statement or testify to my judgment and to what I have observed, such things do exist. Please believe me. Please believe the, those to follow me. Thank you. Uh, these statements are true. I'm willing to testify under oath before Congress. My particular experience, I will testify before Congress if necessary and explain exactly what happened. I was interested in how the whole process functioned how the data got from the lunar orbiter to the laboratory, I asked the young man if he described the process to me, he did. About 30 minutes into the process, he said to me, um, in a very distressed way, um, by the way, we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me, and clearly in these photographs were structures, uh, mushroom-shaped buildings, spherical buildings, and towers. And at, at that point, I was very concerned because I knew we were working on compartmentalized security. He had breached security, and I was actually frightened at that moment. And I did not question him any further. And a few moments later, someone did come into the room. Um, I worked there for three more days, and I remember going home and naively thinking, I can't wait to hear about this on the evening news. And here it is, more than 30 years later, and I hope we hear about it tonight. And I will testify under oath before Congress that what I'm saying is the truth. In 1978, on January 18th, I was going into the base. Every morning I did the uh, briefing to the general staff and I noticed that uh, there are some lights off in the distance at the end of the end runway there. And when I got into the command post, the uh, senior master sergeant in charge said that there had been UFOs in the pattern all night. They're on radar. The tower had seen them. They got in aircraft reports and so on. And that one had landed or crashed at uh, Fort Dix. Fort Dix and McGuire are right together. 
And this is kind of like the Roswell of the East. But in any case, uh, an alien had come off the craft and had been shot by a military policeman and apparently was wounded and was heading for McGuire. So for whatever reason, the uh, aliens liked uh, the Air Force better than the Army, perhaps, because they're <laughs> shooting at them. But in any case, uh, our security police went out there and uh, found him on the end of the runway dead. And uh, they asked me to brief the general staff, of General Tom Sadler, and uh, at the 8 o'clock stand-up briefing. And I said, I don't think I want to do this. You know, the general doesn't have a good sense of humor, and I'm not sure I, I believe this. So I did some checking, called the 438th Command Post, and everybody had pretty much the same story. And uh, at 8 o'clock that morning, just before I went on, was going to brief this, and I was very worried about it. They said, don't brief it, that it's too hot, so to speak. That's pretty much my story, and I'm prepared to tell the story in front of Congress, and uh, it is the truth. But the whole situation is, we've set back, we've told the American people that there's no such thing as UFOs. I've been involved where we have recovered these objects, we know them to be of extraterrestrials. In 1969, I had an event that happened to me while I was stationed at Fort Lee, Virginia. We went to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. That would be my first exposure to any time that we would be recovering an unidentified flying object. When we went there, we already had people that was already in the, in the facility. We were a backup team, which was supposed to be NBC because there was supposed to be some nuclear materials that was on board this craft. Later on, most people involved would have been, were, were to be told that there was nothing on board. It was nothing more than just a crash of one of our aircraft. I know better because I was one of the people that approached it with a Geiger counter to get surface readings. I was the first person to go ahead and see that there were bodies on it. That would be the first of approximately 12 events. UFO crashes are not events that take place every day. They're rare. I know we're not alone in the universe. I know that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's evidence that has been denied to the American people. I stand before you today in my almighty God and I tell you this, if Congress calls me in and says, will you testify in detail what you know, I stand here today prepared and ready to do just that. Governments must never lie to the people for no reason. Thank you. I hope my brothers in arms that went through these events will be given immunity at some point and be able to join us here. It is an honor to share the stage with all of these peop people. And uh, I think for all of our children, my son Dennis, God bless you, son, um, we can change the world. You're heroes for being here also. And I will testify in front of Congress if asked to. God bless. Thank you. We have another 400 of these witnesses. I have carried this burden for eight years. I'm now giving it to you, the American people and the people of the world, to take it forward. What I'd like to do now is open uh, the audience uh, for questions from the media. Let me get to those, okay, quickly, because we are on short on time. First of all, I think initially there was a, an appropriate uh, national security apparatus in place in the 40s during the Truman and also Eisenhower years. By the late Eisenhower years, we have a testimony from Brigadier General Stephen Lovkin, still a practicing attorney, that by the late Eisenhower years that he had lost control of these projects primarily because of the compartmentalization into the military-industrial complex operative word industrial. Um, there are corporations such as SAIC, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, and others that deal specifically with this issue with advanced energy and propulsion systems connected to UFOs. And I think that what has happened from, from the best we can tell uh, from insiders that have briefed me for now about eight years is that we have lost control of these projects from a constitutional law perspective because the infrastructure within military intelligence and corporate channels is so well funded and so complex and labyrinthine that there are compartments within compartments within compartments and people 
people who are in the Congress who make inquiries, and in fact, President Clinton, when he made inquiries, were simply denied access, as you heard earlier that President Carter was denied access. My question is to Clifford Stone. You, you said that you had seen aliens on a, on a craft that had crashed. I wondered if you could describe what they looked like. I could. I could, but it would probably take a whole lot of time. The reason I state that, when I got out in 1989, we had cataloged 57 different species. Uh, you have individuals that look very much like you and myself that could walk among, among us and you wouldn't even notice the difference, except for some of the things that uh, they might be able to go ahead, even in a dark room, and touch an object and go, go ahead and identify what color that object might be. They would have a heightened sense of smell, sight, uh, hearing. Uh, the uh, situation is that you have various types of what we normally call grays. We didn't call them grays in the military, but you had at least three types of the grays. You had some that were much taller than we were. Uh, the unique thing I th uh, that I'd like to point out for the most part is that the entities that we did catalog were in fact humanoid. Now this created a situation where the scientific community was trying to figure out why that would be the case. Because you would expect that if life evolved on other planets that they would take on some type of other uh, being, so to speak. Not necessarily look humanoid or be bi bipedal such as we are. But apparently we got quite a few of the species out there that are humanoid in appearance.